Welcome back to FYI. Today, we're thrilled to be here in Fremont with Elon Musk. I have with me Kathy Wood, ARK Invest's OG innovator and CEO. And I'm Tasha Keeney. I didn't Tasha know what Keeney. that was until today. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Like, well, that's, uh, yeah. It's your new title. And I'm, <laughs> I'm Tasha Keeney. I'm an analyst and I cover autonomous cars at ARK. Elon, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Good to join. You have a great radio voice. <laughs> Doesn't she? Thank you. This like, is why we chose what? her. It's like eerie. She has no. It's uh, uh, we chose Tasha like, to be our Jesus. introduction for FYI. This is called okay. FYI for your innovation. That's our weekly podcast. Okay. And Tasha, should... there was a competition okay. in the office, and Tasha won okay. as the best radio voice. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, I'll try talking in a radio voice. Uh, <laughs> Please see do. See if that works. And, uh... <laughs> I also want to thank you, Elon. We're very excited to do this. Uh, one of the reasons I started ARC is because innovation is being completely mispriced in the public markets as the public markets go passive. Yeah, you I know? totally agree. The Actually, antithesis. Your, totally. John Bogle, who's awesome, may he rest in peace, uh, like when his last comments was like, the, there, there's too much, the, the passive index funds are too big. And he was like, got really... You know, obviously came up with the, you know, the low fee index fund. Yes. So it's and um, the other thing that's happening again, a problem for innovation in the public markets is the big public asset managers, they started looking for innovation in the pre IPO space, yeah. right? So, you know, where we operate is inefficiently priced like I've never seen in my career. Most people looking at our portfolios would not agree because our PE ratios to this year, next year look very high. But we want companies like Tesla to be investing aggressively to capitalize on the massive opportunities we see ahead. So we thank you for not going private. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're welcome. Because we do think if you are going to achieve your goals – you need to be public to scale that quickly and to enjoy the kind of exponential growth that you will enjoy because you're on the right side of change. So we're really excited to be here. Now, what we're not going to talk about too much is electric vehicle sales and certainly not production, right? right, right? right. Because we believe, and just want to get your high-level reaction to this, based on, and this is based on Sam Corris's battery work, uh, cost decline, some of the um, amazing things you're doing with battery pack systems, new chemistries and so forth. The cost declines, if we were relying on that analysis alone, we would see EV sales, given the price elasticity of demand, increase from 1.3 million last year to 26 million in 2023, so in five years. So that's a 20-fold increase if the battery capacity were there and so and production capacity. What do you think about that? That would be the high-level assumption, top-down. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Wow. So that's a th about a third of total global sales at that time. I mean, you might be off by a year or two, but not by much. That's huge. Now, for our bottom-up modeling, we're very conservative. So the range that we are out there in terms of our bare bull range, 700 to 4,000, that is based on one point Tesla selling 1.6 million units in that year, which given our top-down analysis and given how far you are ahead of any other auto manufacturer and any other technology company, that 1.6 million is increasingly looking way too conservative if you can scale to take the proper amount of share or the share you should take given how advanced you are. So maybe you could give us some of your thoughts there. Yeah, I want to emphasize that if I give estimates, these are really, there's a lot of guesswork here. Oh. And especially on an exponential curve, a year or two difference makes is, is enormous. Obviously, it says we've got a lot of criticism for the number of cars we delivered in 2017. Because if you say like the area under the curve of production in 2017 was quite small because it was the beginning of an exponential ramp. But then once that got going, the area under the curve was enormous. Yes. And that's why people were so shocked. Yes. I, I kept trying to say this, but they, people don't understand, I guess, what an exponential means. Or, or They don't. They're yeah. all linear thinkers. Yes. yes. Yes, exactly. So like last year, we basically doubled our global fleet. Because we, cumulatively, we made and delivered more, it was about, about as many cars as we had made in our entire history. 
I know. Right, it's exactly. Crazy. I'm, I'm, you crazy. guys know, but I'm just saying, <laughs> for the audience out there. Most people thought it was impossible. Yes. And if you do a linear extrapolation, it certainly would be. But when making estimates against an exponential, small changes in the the calendar breakpoint um, have enormous percentage differences. The time difference is small, but the percentage difference is enormous. Now, I'm just I'm saying things that you guys know, but it's this is for the broader audience yes, out there. Yes. No. We want this. Yes. We want people to understand this. Right. Like getting to five thousand cars peak production per week was offset by approximately six months from my initial estimate last year. So I thought we'd be there end of 2017. It took us six months longer. In the grand scheme of things, six months late uh, for a massive new program is not much. But this was characterized in the press in terms of the percentage of units and instead of a calendar shift. And so it was perceived as a massive shortfall when in fact it was merely a six-month delay. And when I give these, say, my guesses for the future, if you move six months or 12 months, these numbers are, it can be 50 to 100% different. So, but if you say like, what's my guess for 2021 is one and a half million cars for Tesla, something like that. 2021 and 2023, which is that 26 million, if we knew only the cost decline associated with the batteries, 2023 20, number, if we're right, could be 26 million, but it really, it's it's actually dependent on what you do more than almost any, and ch what China does, and what you do in China. Again, just guess, probably we do 3 million. So very exciting times ahead. That's way above what anyone is thinking out there. And even above what we have assumed bottom up just to remain conservative, because we already seem a little out there in terms of our expectations. So what we wanted to do with this podcast is spend more time on your autonomous strategy. We're very happy that retail investors are asking questions about this on your call. Uh, we wish more institutional, institutional yes. investors would understand how important this is, not only to your model, but how it's going to change your valuation from that of from today to really software as a service almost. So yes. So maybe... Sorry, did you? Yeah, no, absolutely. You can sort of think of uh, our cars, maybe long term, as being effectively carriers for the autonomy, that's autonomy software. Yes. The, so it's like they're a vehicle, literally and figuratively, for autonomy, uh, the, the software that rides on them. Yes. Yes. So Tasha has been doing a lot of our work on uh, autonomous taxi networks. We've been working on these models for five years, and it's extended into autonomous truck platoons, into parcel drones and uh, passenger drones. So we're very focused on this and would love to explore it a little bit more with you in terms of what you're doing. Tasha? Yeah. So my first question is, you know, Tesla wasn't always pursuing fully autonomous driving. If you look back in 2013, there's a couple quotes from you saying, you know, that last 10% is incredibly hard and you need to keep a human in the loop. What's changed your mind? No, I still think the last 10% is of autonomy is extremely difficult or, or even the last 1% of autonomy is really difficult. I think there's like there's a couple of things that we help to calibrate uh, with, with the audience. And if I may go back to, to one thing, like generally, like, for example, if I say, we will reach 5,000 cars a week. What, what I mean is that's the, that's the peak production. But then just, just for reference, when, if you have peak production of X, then you're going to be like somewhere between 80 and 85% of, of that for average production through the quarter uh, when taking public holidays um, and equipment maintenance into account. Then also for in de defining autonomy or full self-driving, I, I think we will be feature complete full self-driving this year, meaning the car will be able to find you in a parking lot, pick you up, take you all the way to your destination without an intervention this year. I would say that I'm certain of that. That is not a question mark. However, people sometimes will extrapolate that to mean now it works with 100% certainty, requiring no observation perfectly. This is not the case. Once it is feature complete, then you're sort of kind of the march of nines. How many nines of reliability do you do you want it to be? And then when do regulators agree that it is that that is that reliable? So there's feature complete for full self driving this year with certainty. This is something that we control, and I manage autopilot engineering directly every week in detail. So I'm I'm certain of this. Then 
when will regulators allow us even to have these features turned on with uh, human oversight? But that's a variable which we, we have limited control over. Then it's when will regulators agree that that these things can be done without human oversight? That is an, an, another level beyond that. So these are externalities we don't quite control. And the conservatism of regulators varies a lot from one jurisdiction to another. My guess as to when we would think it's safe for somebody to essentially fall asleep and wake up the destination probably towards the end of next year. That's that's when I, when I would think it's most likely it will be safe enough for that. I don't know when regulators will agree. Do you think they'll agree in China first? Could you imagine that happening? China really wants to leapfrog the rest of the world. And as you've said, the, the mayors of cities and presumably the regulators are tech savvy because that's what's going to get them there. And we've generally found the regulators in China to be very thoughtful, quite smart. Yeah, I've really f found them to be very good. We've also found the US at a federal level to be very good as well. California can be a little overzealous, but US federal, China federal is good. Europe is a little conservative in this regard. Yeah, we, we've heard sort of similar things about Europe, that yeah. the environment's moving a little bit slower there. Interesting. So, I mean, this is an amazing technological feat. What gives you the confidence that this is a solvable problem? And then why should Tesla be the one to solve this? Well, I, first of all, I think it's helpful to clarify with people. People think sometimes that I'm like a business person or finance person or something like that. I, I'm an engineer. I do engineering, always have. So, I mean, I wrote software for like 15 years, 20 years. And I understand technology and software at quite a fundamental level. I know what we need to solve to make full self-driving feature complete. I think we've got an extremely good technical team. I, I, I think we really have the, the best people. It's an honor to work with them. I'm certain that we will get this done this year. So can I ask you about autopilot? So to what degree is consumer use of autopilot important in terms of furthering along the process? Because it seems like, you know, not every consumer is going to use it. It might vary person to person. Should you sort of incentivize people to use it, maybe auto initiate? Is that even possible? Well, here, I think we're talking about quality of the data. Is that what you're talking about? The data that you're getting, because you can monitor all the data, but the quality with autopilot is superior, I would imagine. The advantage that we have that I think is very difficult to overcome is that we have just a vast amount of data on interventions. So effectively, the customers are training the system on how to drive. And there are millions of corner cases. They're so obscure and weird, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, there's, there's different road marking, there's different rules in different countries, different expectations. You've got rain, snow, sleet, hail, you know, hurricanes, floods, fires, smoke, <laughs> dust. It's insane. I know. But we've got cars in almost all, really in all those environments. And so we, every time somebody intervenes, takes over from autopilot, it saves that information on and uploads it to our system. We, we don't know which car it was or how, what happened. You know, there's no individual attribution for the car. We just know that that intervention took place. And then we see what is required to fix that intervention. And we're really starting to get quite good at not even requiring human labeling. Basically, the the person, say, drives the intersection, we know then and is thereby training autopilot what to do. Right, right. Do you think one of the questions we debate a lot when we look at what uh, way happenings at, what is happening at Waymo and cruise automation is that it seems as though y the artificial intelligence or deep learning or deep reinforcement learning that you're l using you know is probabilistic they seem to be more deterministic in their approach uh, because we're just looking at what's going wrong there yes. and that's what that suggests is does that what you yeah, essentially, a heuristics approach to this uh, will result in a local maximum of capability, so not a global maximum. I think you really have to apply a sophisticated neural net to achieve a global maximum. And this is why the reliance on LIDAR is unwise. It, it gets you to a certain point, but no further. And so basically, a series of if-then-else statements in LIDAR is not going to solve it. Forget it. You're just game over. You have to solve vision, perception, essentially understanding and with vision, and then it's solved. You don't need anything else. No other sensors at all. I mean, we drive cars with basically two cameras that aren't very good and on a gimbal that doesn't move very fast. <laughs> and a professional driver will almost 
have almost never have an accent. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, a lot of the time we get a lot of pushback in this idea of data and sort of what data is more important than others. I guess maybe highlight for us like a, I mean, Tesla has more real real world miles than anyone else by far. I think we must have. More than everyone else. uh, Maybe a hundred times more than everyone else. Yeah. You said 5%, I think on, you you said they have altogether 5% of. It's probably closer to 1%. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. So there must be sort of events that are specific to Tesla in there that no one else has. I guess, could you sort of talk about some of that uniqueness? Well, I think it's just really the, the, the long tail of weird events, the million weird situations, you know, all sorts of weather conditions, all kinds of road conditions, situations where the road rules aren't even followed. Like they're not, they're not always followed. Like, you know, say somebody working on the road might make a mistake and then suddenly you've, you've got a situation where there are no, no road cones. Uh, or there's a big hole in the road, or something really nutty, or a completely strange object that's on the road that's not recognized. So it's really the the the, the reason Tesla I think is making rapid progress is because we have vastly more data, and this is increasing exponentially. With as our fleet is increasing exponentially, our data is increasing exponentially. Then I think we've got like I said the best technical team, and although I've brought it up before, people don't seem to really be. Uh, taking note of the fact that the Tesla autopilot AI computer is about to roll into production, you know, anyone who's ordered full self-driving will will get that replay, will get that for free. It's really, you know, I've said it has like maybe it's like a order of magnitude improvement over the Nvidia system that we have, but it's really more like maybe two thousand percent. Yeah, our analyst on AI deep learning spent nine years at Nvidia and concluded that you were at least three years, just looking initially at the specs, at least three years ahead of anybody else out there, any other auto manufacturer. Yeah, and we, we started the CHIP program about three years ago because it, it just seems as though we, we would want to advance making things. If you want to have a complex neural network, you need a combination of software and hardware. Um, and your software needs to be that much better in order to compensate for hardware if the hardware is weaker. You know, if you look sort of like, say, how video games and how they progress, it's a combination of software and and hardware. No amount of clever software could produce a video game on old hardware that you have today. It just doesn't matter, you know. So the same thing with neural nets. So right now we can process on the order of, you know, 100 frames a second. And we really need to do a lot of work in terms of cropping the frames and sort of bending the pixels and uh, not going to full resolution on all cameras and that kind of thing with the current hardware, we're at full frames, full resolution with the, with the Tesla hardware, all cameras at full resolution, full frames. Wow, that's and crazy. And it still hasn't tapped out. Yeah. So is the amount of compute processing power that you need for full autonomy fixed? Or would you have to upgrade this every two years? How do you think about that? Well, I mean, I do think that we could we can achieve, we could in principle achieve full autonomy with the NVIDIA hardware. But it's a much harder software problem, and like so, yeah, like you sort of really have to try to budget your compute and do all sorts of tricks to manage how you use your compute. So it's a harder software problem with um, hardware that's you know two thousand percent better. You just you don't have to do that that constant budgeting, it, and so the software software problem is much easier. So like I think with the current hardware and a lot of effort, we could we could get to full self driving with maybe. Maybe being like fifty to one hundred percent safer than a person, but with hardware three, I think it's probably like a thousand percent safer than wow. a person. Are you presenting this to the regulators? Do they understand this? Do they want to understand this? I think they'll they understand data. So if we show yeah. you know billions of miles w- with a given safety level, then they will they certainly appreciate that. I mean, simply saying like, hey, we've got this really fast computer and everything's going to work. It's like, well, you know, that's just a statement. Like, but if you've got hard data, billions of miles, and you can show the accident rate and the intervention rate, and that essentially it's unsafe if you don't have autopilot on. Right. Which I think really it's unequivocal at this point. No matter how you slice slice the data, it is unequivocal at this point that it's safer to have autopilot on. The the data comment you just made, we were uh, very interested that the regulators, after they examined the first fatality, I think it was the the data the data around the first fatality that. They just swung in your favor. I, I think it was shocking, and I'm surprised more people haven't uh, really taken note of that. Yeah, it, there is a, a phenomenon that we that we noticed that would that would happen 
essentially it's like if you yeah people just get get overconfident with the system even though we repeatedly warn them you must pay attention to the road like literally every time you use autopilot it says you must pay attention to the road you must keep your hands on the wheel every single time you use it it says this and if you take your hands off the wheel for too long it will start beeping at you and then slow down and that kind of thing so anyway so it's just but really at this point there's this just, just flat out no question that it's safer was you know like i would recommend it to to anyone um, it's just getting better so yeah so have you noticed a change in the regulatory environment are you feeling sort of more confident than previously or is this sort of you know it's still such an open question that i mean tesla's in a really unique position because you have the data to show them so it almost seems like you know you could be having sort of more advanced conversations about sort of proving that safety level i guess what are your what are your thoughts right now we're with a few exceptions we are not being held back by regulators is that a U.S. comment or is it global? I mean, it's, there are a few jurisdictions in the world that are more conservative. Right now, it's it's. I would not uh, say that we're held back by regulators in minor ways. Like for example, like we expect to, I think, get the latest autopilot approval. Navigator autopilot, I think, is going to get approved in Europe next week or something like that. But this is these are tiny delays yeah. in the in the grand yeah. scheme of things. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's great. And so as you think about sort of this development of autonomous driving and, and the rollout strategy, you know, Tesla's not taking this other approach that say Waymo and, and others are doing going city by city. You're going to do a wider rollout. There's still sort of, I don't know if you want to call it geofencing, but there's, you know, it, it's you start with highways and then you go sort of off highway. And then are you going to go country by country or, or sort of how are you thinking of this evolving? In terms of sort of the full steps to, I guess, to get to full autonomy, you know, are you then tackling intersections? Or are you sort of adding feature, 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 and then country by country? Yeah, we, we, we start off with with highway because that tends to be the what actually matters the most. If like you, if particularly if you're stu stuck in traffic and stop and go traffic, that's very painful, and it has the, the most benefit to have autonomy on freeways, which are usually con congested in almost every city in the world. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, myself and others doing is that. Even if there's a shorter way home, you still take the highway because you can use autopilot. I stopped using Waze, for example, just like, you know, just take the highway because then I have autopilot on. You know, going through a bunch of windy streets versus, which is yes. kind of like a lot of mental yes. overhead as yes. opposed to just sitting on the highway and cruising along is, is, is better. So we are generally got, gone with, uh, okay, what's going to add the most value to people? But also, hi, you know, highway accidents tend to be higher velocity and so more okay. potentially more dangerous. Like fatalities are very proportionate to speed. Below a certain speed, it's very difficult to hurt yourself or die, in, 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 particularly in a Tesla. Above a certain speed, it's, it's more dangerous. So it's, it's like, okay, where, where can it be most helpful from a convenience and a safety standpoint? So if we focus on highways for that reason, then intersections are the next thing. And some of them, it, it, that you have a lot of variance in intersections. So that's what, you know, we're working on right now. And, you know, it's, it's working at a development level, no problem recognizing stop signs and, and traffic lights, but you do get ambiguity in some complex intersections with traffic lights, like which one's the, light, the, the right light to focus on. Even if you're a person, it's not always clear. Yeah. So that, that's the, what we're working on there. So we'll try to make that work in the US and then we'll extend that functionality elsewhere. So it, in like highways in Europe are different particularly when you deal with corner cases. So we're kind of making it work in like Norway is a priority for us because we've got a lot of customers there. And I think we're close to having that ready. Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland. I guess one general question. What do you think of letting other automakers build on Tesla's platform? <laughs> I mean, generally we found it's like quite, it's not, it's not easy to work with traditional automakers. It's not like, first of all, they're not exactly banging down our door to work with us. Nobody took you up on your patents. I, no, patents. I think I think they have actually. Oh, you really? Yeah, yeah. okay, that's on, interesting. On the patents, they have. That's very different from, say, creating an integrated system. Sure. Like, like oh, so, yeah. you know, if, if if there was a automaker out there that wanted to implement the same hardware system as as Tesla and and use our software, I think we'd be very open to it. But we're not going to change it. What, what tends to happen is they want to work with us, but then they'll say, "Oh, but we want you to change the following like six things." Like, no, because it's going <laughs> to slow us down massively. Yeah. And and so we you know it's like if you want to use exactly our thing, that's fine. Yeah. But then they don't want to use exactly our thing. Right. We're open to other automakers using our supercharged network. We're open to them to using using our autopilot system. They just need to make it work without a ton of overhead on Tesla engineering. Absolutely, the right thing to do. I have a little bit of a different question for the. It's a little bit off topic, but 
it's in the news or it's becoming more in the news. Uh, so it's about crypto, crypto assets, crypto, uh, you know. Um, uh-huh. Crypto, uh, seriously? Chris, seriously, seriously, very seriously. I think you and Jack Dorsey have chatted a bit uh, recently about this, right? Bitcoin and Ethereum scammers were so rampant on on uh, Twitter that I, I said I'd just join in. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said like one point, one buy some Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I saw uh, that. And then I got <laughs> my account got suspended because <laughs> oh, no. they obviously had like some automatic rule that would, if you try to sell Bitcoin oh, or no. something. <laughs> but I was just joking. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So my, my, my question is a little it's a it's a little different from cryptocurrencies. Although, given your history in the payments ecosystem, it would be very interesting to know if you agree with Jack and there is going to be one native. Of uh, cryptocurrency when it comes to the internet. He thinks it's Bitcoin. It's, it's interesting. I have some friends of mine that are kind of really involved in crypto. I mean, I think like the Bitcoin structure was quite brilliant. Yeah, it seems like there's some merit to Ethereum as well and, and maybe some of the others. But, you know, I'm not sure. It's like, I'm not sure that it would be a good use of Tesla resources to get involved in crypto. I mean, we're really just trying to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. And I mean, I think actually one of the downsides of crypto is that it, computationally, it's like quite energy intensive. So like there had to be some kind of constraint on the creation of crypto. So, but it's very energy intensive to create like the incremental Bitcoin at this point. Yeah. But at the, at same, by the same time, there were $1.3 trillion worth of transactions in Bitcoin. And we don't see it here because it's not for pizza or Coke. It, it's business uh-huh. to business Might in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we think it is business to business in Africa where it is prohibitively expensive to convert from one nation's currency to another. You have to go through the dollar. The, I mean, it really is very important to it's money over IP for them. It's free yeah. transmission of money. And that's yeah. really important to opening up the world. And, you know, it, you know, yeah. it bypasses currency controls. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's well, and uh, if, yeah, it, uh, paper money is going away. Yes. Um, and crypto is a far better way to transfer value than than pieces of paper. That's for sure. Without a doubt. That has its pros and cons. Just to clarify, Tesla's not going to start selling Bitcoin anytime soon. No, we're not. Okay, you heard no, it no. here first, even though everyone thought that. No. <laughs> so, no, well, we, we thank you so much for yes, doing this. You. And thank you for just doing what you're doing to change the world and make it a better place. Like, you know, that's what we're doing uh, in terms of it. No, seriously. I always think of Silicon Valley, that, you know, comedy. <laughs> Have you seen that, that show? Uh, it's pretty um, funny. I'm sure I didn't. But, <laughs> it's like know. literally every company. I'm sure, every time my company that. did. Pretty often, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh that's yeah. what people say. Yeah, like literally no. every company. Oh, okay, well, but you're really doing it, and you're really like, doing making it. Making the world a better place by social, mobile, yeah. oh, no, no, crypto. No, no, no. This, is, this is so different. This is so different. We totally agree with you. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. No, you're doing the real thing. Cool. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. <laughs>